I'm going to talk about underdogs today, and I was just reminded of what an underdog I am. I was backstage with Jeff Rust and Travis Hansen. Jeff came up and said, who's a better basketball player, you or Travis? And uh, Travis was like me, and I remember, man, I am an underdog. I was actually really touched. If you were here this morning with Clint, when Clint Betts kicked this off, I was actually touched by his story. If, if you didn't hear it real quick, he shared a letter, basically, that he wrote about being adopted and about his first school dance. And this is something that resonates with me right now because my oldest is 14 years old and he's just going to his first school dances. And the advice that Clint's brother, his only brothers can do, gave to him as he walked out the door for his first dance was, just don't look like the adopted kid. Um, we have probably all felt like underdogs before. Certainly, Clint felt that way that day, but I've got good news. I think underdogs are built to win in entrepreneurship and built to win in a big way. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Again, my name is Jeff Burningham. I'm a serial entrepreneur, founder of Peak Capital, and then most recently, Peak Ventures. And I wanna tell you about kind of the top three qualities I look for and entrepreneurs that we now back, I back as a venture capitalist at Peak Ventures. Uh, by the way, those three things are, they're catalyzed, I think, by being an underdog, and we'll talk more about that today. But they are, number one, a will to win. Number two, the ability to rally and or lead a team. And number three, big vision. But before we get into those, let me get into my story. And this is apropos with... Uh, what I just spoke about with Travis. So, this is uh, me as a high school senior. I love sports. I was a point guard in high school. I was a quarterback in high school. I have always loved sports. Uh, but I'm 5'8". In my Jordans, I'm 5'8". Like, without my Jordans, I'm like 5'7 and a quarter or a half, maybe. And this was my competition, not Shaq. But uh, Scott Pollard, does anyone remember Scott Pollard? He had kind of a middling career in the NBA, but he was big, 6'11", 278. This is who I played against in high school. In fact, I remember one time in a, in a kind of a regional semifinal game. I was a sophomore, Scott was a senior, and I was playing. This, the winner went to the state playoffs. And I remember Scott dunking on me ferociously and looking at the stand and beating his chest. And uh, I was a sophomore, maybe 15 years old. And I, I clearly remember him kind of like, I felt like he was looking down at me, you know, hanging from the rim. And I, I just kind of thought, sometimes we're not built to win. Or it feels like we're not built to win. And startups are often like this. We may not feel built to win. We, we may not be ready to win then. But hopefully the seeds of something special are germinating kind of within us uh, so that we can win. Like I said, the first thing that I, oops, the first thing that I look for um, in an entrepreneur is this will to win. Um, most people shy away from adversity. They go away from adversity. Is my wife here? Sally, are you here? Um, yeah, Sally's awesome. Sally will tell you that if I don't have adversity uh, for a period of time, like I get really uncomfortable actually. I get fidgety and sometimes it's not good or wise. I almost create my own adversity because I want to be stretched. I want to be challenged and I think entrepreneurs are like that. They seek out adversity. In fact, being an entrepreneur blows up this feeling of security. Every day is a challenge to grow, to learn, and to innovate. And honestly, speaking from personal experience, that's why I chose to be an entrepreneur. I started my first tech business when I was an undergrad at BYU, and I chose to be an entrepreneur over other things because I liked this challenge. I wanted this challenge. We ascribe so much to success. In, in, on, you know, in life, we 
there's been a lot of people up here who supposedly are successful or successful in some way, and they are, and it's been great. But there's been a lot of failures along the way, for sure, for all of them. The, the key as an underdog is how you react to this failure, what it pushes inside of you, and if you can develop this will to win. I think the best underdogs have this honed-in ability to win and to compete and to fight because they've had to their entire lives. Again, we ascribe too much to success and we don't talk about failure. In my opinion, failure, failure is often just data. And it's really useful data if we use it in the right ways. It can be data to us that we can then use to become better and get better. The other interesting thing about will, and then I'll move on, is that it's like a muscle. Uh, researchers say that will is not innate. It's like a muscle that you can build. And you build it by challenging yourself, by doing something new, by struggling, by getting up after you fall down. And so will can be built. And I believe that underdogs are, are built to have this steely resolve and will. Now, there are a lot of underdogs, too, obviously, that maybe get used to losing. Uh, they get used to the status quo. They accept things the way they are. And those usually aren't the type of entrepreneurs that we like to back. We like to back fighters. Um, so I told you a little bit, I love football as well. And I was a high school quarterback, again, a short one. And I dug way back in the archives for this one just for... Uh, this event, I actually didn't. I came in a couple of weeks ago, and my kids were like, Dad, Dad, you know, come here. We're watching you play football. My wife had burned some old um, VHS tapes we had onto DVDs. And um, here's a little highlight reel from my eighth grade year of football. I'm number nine, the quarterback here. <laughs> so that was in Spokane, Washington, the Horizon Hawks forever. I love actually, I think the best sports or the best position in sports is being a quarterback because it's very cerebral as well as physical, you know, and I just, I just love the challenge actually of being a quarterback. I have a little sixth grade quarterback right now. In fact, his first tackle football game is tomorrow night and I'm really excited for him for that. But the point of this little clip is to show you that, and to remind you, though, of the second reason I believe that underdogs are built to win, and that is the ability to rally a team. The guy who caught that pass became an NFL tight end, Mike Roberg. So you saw that tall, lanky guy? He added like 100 pounds and maybe an inch or two, and he became an NFL tight end. You never win alone. I've never won alone, whether in business or in sports. You never win alone. So the second kind of key that I look for in the entrepreneurs I back is this ability to lead and to rally a team, to have persuasion and influence along the life of a startup. Because you're only as good as the people that you can bring to, to kind of play with you and to win with you. The best, the best founders rally the best teams. And at Peak Ventures, we view ourselves as a team, uh, more, more like an extension of the teams that we back. We seek to add value in ways that aren't easy to necessarily replicate. And we love that camaraderie and team feeling. Um, I just, I, I heard Greg Warnock mention this, I think, today as well, and I just completely agree with him that the idea about influence and persuasion is so important in entrepreneurship because it is hard to get people to row with you. It is hard to get people on board and to fight with you, but you have to do it. That's part of being a leader. That's part of being an entrepreneur. I look back on my career a little bit and uh, could think of kind of three times when I showed maybe a little bit of vision. So the last thing is this big vision. And you're, we're going to hear a lot of rah-rah about Utah, and I am super bullish on Utah and very excited about what's happening in Utah. That's why Peak Ventures is here in Provo, Utah, the first institutional venture fund in Provo. 
I am excited about what's going on. But we can do better, I believe. We need to have bigger vision. I believe it's the responsibility of us, partly the responsibility of us investors, to raise entrepreneurs' visions, to help them see what they be can become. When I look back at uh, my career, I started a technology company as an undergrad at BYU. Uh, my wife was a second grade school teacher making like $2,000 a year, so we were rich. I did, this was my senior year at BYU, and I was free to start a company. And I started a company called Mindwire. Obviously, you see the date there, and it's there for a reason. The hard part at Mindwire really started when? A year later, right? In 2001. 9-11-2001, when technology companies were kind of falling off the face of the earth. But we had a vision of what we could become and how we could grow through this, and we did it. In 2006, I started Peak Capital Partners with two, two awesome partners, two of my best friends, Jeff Danley and Jamie Dunn. You'll remember, too, in 2006 and 2007, people were running from apartments. They were running from real estate. They were fearful. That was kind of our thesis, and that was our cue to come in, and we bought, we've bought about a billion and a half dollars of real estate in the last eight years. In 2014, started Peak Ventures with an awesome partner, Sid Cromanhook. Um, Sid and I have been thinking about Peak Ventures and talking about it for years. Uh, we are founders backing founders, excited to try to be accretive to what is already here in Utah, to throw our hat in the ring and to sweat with companies, we kind of hang our hat on the experience we've had of growing ourselves as entrepreneurs, taking funding, paying back funding, exiting, and all different types of things. And suffice it to say, at Peak Ventures, we definitely feel like an underdog. So again, the third thing that I look for is big vision. And you, some of you may know this guy. This is a local young entrepreneur named Garrett G. You may know his story. He started a a company uh, called Scan that he sold to Snapchat. Every time, actually, I meet with Garrett, I leave inspired because of his big vision. The reason this is important is that venture is an upside maximization business. It's not a downside protection business. So we want to back entrepreneurs with vision to take things to the moon. And I think that's a way that we can improve here in Utah is big vision around changing the world from within our state here. Uh, the most important thing I've learned in the last 18 months is certainly this. The greatest privilege of being a venture capitalist is building relationships with entrepreneurs. And we've been fortunate enough in a short amount of time to back some of the best. And I'd like to kind of end my speech with a couple of stories and a couple of things that we're doing to build entrepreneurship. Again, the idea is that we need to build something big together and we need each other to get there. We do this and we engage with entrepreneurs in a couple of ways. First of all, peak play. We like to have fun. Uh, I ended up being a walk-on point guard in college. Sid was a walk-on basketball player at the U of U, actually. And so you may have heard, or this is another reminder, we have challenged any startup in the state to play us in basketball. Uh, come bring your game. We haven't lost yet. We're 5-0, and oh, and we're looking for more challengers. Um, this is a good way for us. We'll buy sandwiches after. This is a good way for us to engage with you on a personal level and get to know you, for you to get to know us and how we like to play. Another thing that we've done is we've kind of is this peak sessions. We've held kind of the first in-state uh, idea around this peak sessions. We bring uh, local founders and CEOs together and have meaningful events. This is a picture of Aaron Sconard and I last week up at Pluralsight talking about to 40 awesome founders about success, not just in business, but in life. A couple months ago, we were at, up at an advisor's a uh, place in Park City, Mike Leventhal. We hosted a Kleiner Perkins partner. I think the first time a partner from Kleiner Perkins out of the Bay Area had ever been in Utah, and we talked about raising Series A funding. These events are meaningful to us. These events are ways for us to give back and to connect with the entrepreneurs that we are so fortunate to back. Now, let me tell you about two of them, and then I'm done. 
this is, uh, these might not be the biggest names or the biggest companies, but I, I don't really care about that. What I care about is this guy behind the helmet. His name's Peter Thorpe, and he's an entrepreneur. He's also a full-time firefighter. And I know this. I first met Peter while judging a BYU business plan competition maybe four or five years, four years ago or so. We invested in his business before Peak Venture Fund won. So my partners and I, Jeff, Jamie, and I took a couple million dollars from our real estate personally and started angel investing for several years now. And one of the guys that we backed was Peter. S Sid and I, so let me tell you this story about Peter real quick, because this brought it home for me. And the quality of people that we're able to back is really inspiring to me. Sid and I were having lunch a couple weeks ago with an entrepreneur when this entrepreneur started to have a medical emergency. And it was really scary for Sid and I. Um, we cleared the table, moved the table, got this entrepreneur on their back, trying to help them. I ran around the restaurant asking if there was a doctor that was there, and there wasn't. So I call, called 911. And five minutes later, sure, who do you think walked through the door? Peter Thorpe walked through the door, <laughs> took control, saved, at least in my mind, this entrepreneur's life. And it gave me an even greater appreciation for entrepreneurs. This guy is saving lives and fighting fires by day and building a really cool company by night. And I'm grateful to have backed him. Lastly, uh, Tim Chavez. I love Tim uh, because he was one of the first entrepreneurs we backed as angels like four or five years ago. And we had hard times. He moved into our basement. We backed his company called IRAP. It was a super hard uh, thing, that he, a super hard problem that he was trying to solve. And we had our ups and downs. Um, like I said, the greatest privilege of being a venture capitalist is these relationships. And I actually appreciate when I get a bad news call from my entrepreneur, maybe even more than good news, because it means that they trust me. They trust us. They know that we are with them through thick and thin, because we are. And Tim's an example of that. I remember one time being in the basement with IRAP. We were going through a really hard thing. And Tim may remember this. I, I said, IRAP is the devil's favorite hobby. Just out of the blue. So we have this joke where we just say that I rap is the devil's favorite hobby. Like it was so hard. We just wanted to give up. Anyways, we ended up selling that business to Zag, a good successful exit after a lot of turmoil and hard work. Um, I was fortunate enough to write a, a letter for Tim for MBA school. He got back from HBS uh, a couple months ago. Six months ago, he reached out to us and said, Jeff, I've been working on this venture at Harvard Business School for the last six months. I'd like you to take a look at. And it's called Flow. And um, so now we've backed Tim and Flow. And he's kind of our first repeat, I guess you could say, entrepreneur with Peak Ventures. Um, and I think that these guys exemplify the underdog traits that we're looking for. The will to win the ability to lead and rally a team, and having big vision. So underdogs, don't ever give up. You can never have enough fighters in your corner as an entrepreneur. You can do it. We're excited to be here in Utah and appreciate this. Thanks so much.